But I always start off with just getting background. So where, where, where exactly, because we have an international artist um, audience, where, where exactly are you from? I'm, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Wow. Mm -hmm. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I live about 10 minutes from Brooklyn now in Long Island. And it's a part of New York called Valley Stream. Yeah, and uh, on the east coast of the United States. Yeah, no, yeah, I think a lot of us are very familiar with New York films yeah. and everything. Um, but <laughs> during those days, how did you did you were you always into music when you were growing up? Um, I I was because my dad was a church musician. He played uh the piano and organ in church, so I started playing the piano and organ in church as well. So by the time I I guess around eight eight between eight and 10 years old, I started playing the piano at church and that, that became my job all the way up through high school. Like every Sunday I would play the piano. Um, on Tuesdays, I would teach the choir songs. And wow. that's, kind of, that's how I got my start in music in a Baptist church. And I think, you know, uh, most of our, us who aren't American would not be surprised because we've seen from lots of stories that a lot of R&B artists started to hone their skills from the church it seems as if yeah. the church was a factory of musicians or something like that yeah factory of musicians and you and you always had an audience you know ah, every yeah. sunday you, you, you was in front of an audience so it kind of gave you a little bit of courage of performing and um you know just playing good music you know so but yeah. those days you focused on 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 playing what about the singing part was um, at the beginning, I really wasn't into singing that much. I, I could teach parts and do the harmonies. Even at the beginning of intro, I was more the producer than a singer. Just, just like within between the first album and the second album, I kind of really started, you know, from working with Kenny Green, God bless his soul, I learned a lot about singing. He was like my, my vocal coach. And um, prior to that, I had wanted to be a producer and maybe, if luck had it, a rapper. I really wasn't okay. into singing. You know, I was just into doing the music. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. So back back when you were in, in, in high school and, and playing, who, who were your influences musically? Um, of things, people that you used to listen to yeah. really? Mm -hmm. uh, James Ingram. Oh, okay, yes, I remember that one. James Ingram. It's real. Uh, yeah. DeBarge. Oh, L is it the group or, or just L? Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the the group. Love Me in a Special Way, like those songs right there. Yeah. Because they, they sound like gospel songs, but they were R&B songs. So yeah. they really they caught my ear. Luther Vandross. Oh, Luther. Uh, let me see who else. Um, so many, man. No addition, you know, <laughs> during that time. Not so much musically, but like the whole fat of it you know the whole movement was like yeah, phenomenal yeah. I was like man that gotta be so much fun you know yeah and then during that time did you, did you, did you did you have your hair hard set on being a full-time performer or was it just like stuff you did on Sundays and yeah it was stuff that I did on Sundays I actually I, I wanted to be a baseball player I had my heart set on playing baseball okay. and um I just knew all the way through high school that I just wanted to be a baseball player, like me and my friends. And um, it was one day during baseball practice, the army recruiters walked out of the school and they started yelling at me. They was like, what are you doing after high school? What are you doing after high school? And I was like, I don't know. So they came out onto the baseball field and started talking to me about joining the army. And I just, I just got sucked in. I went and I took the test. And as a senior in high school, I joined the army. <laughs> Did your dad say, okay, good luck, son? Or what um, my, my parents were pretty much, you know, like I said, I, I was working pretty much since I was like 10 years old. You know, I, I had a job and I was pretty much supporting myself. I was living at home with them. Yeah. But they they kind of trust my judgment. And um, we did have a conversation. My father was like, you don't want to go to college? I was like, because I have a sister that's right underneath me. So I was like, I've ever heard take the money and go to college because I know she'll apply herself. If I go to college, I'm just going for the, what I've seen, like chasing the girls and the parties. And, you know, that's definitely what I would have went to college for. So I say, I'm going to go into the military. So um, had I known then what I know now, then I probably would have played baseball because 
the funny thing is, right, my father, he never took me to baseball games. So most of the times I was watching baseball, it was on television. And yeah. by watching baseball on television, everybody looks like a giant. So I was like, I'm too small to be a professional uh, baseball player. Even though I was good and I had the skills and everything, I was saying to myself, oh, I'm too small to play baseball. Then later on, I started meeting professional baseball players that were smaller than me or like the average of them was like my, my size. Yeah, and yeah. so I kind of like faked myself out of that. But um, my, and my friends that I was playing with ever since we was little kids, they just stuck with it. They're like, yeah, we're going to get some money playing baseball. And they went and played professional baseball. Yep. Okay, so they all went into the MLB. NF- um, um, uh, yep, MLB. One went to the Brewers. Wow, one went to the cool. Seattle Mariners. He was roommates with Ken Griffey Jr., Oh, yeah. <laughs> and these were my like, friends, you know, so I've always felt like if I would have stuck with baseball, I would have had like equal success with baseball and music. But I'm glad I got into music. Yeah, you know, I definitely have no regrets. It's been a phenomenal experience. Yeah. So you joined the army. Um, mm-hmm. I would take it, you know, you have to you have to be 18 before they let you join in. Yeah, I joined in. I joined in March. And I went in August 30th. I was 18 when I went in. Okay. Yeah. And and so when what's well what I mean what year was this? This was a long time ago, 1984. Okay. <laughs> so I was thinking 84. So I'm thinking what 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 was going on in, in 84? Apart 84 from it was any, pretty calm. It wasn't really yeah, any so was, yeah, there wasn't Iraq hadn't started anything like that or Afghanistan. So that's that's when I ended up getting out after that war. I stayed through that war. And that's when the intro kicked off right after, excuse me, right after that war. That's- after the intro, okay. So during, mm-hmm. so during that time in, in the army, what would, did you put away your music and just focus on the army? Or what were you able to do? Um, well, that's where I met the lead singer, Kenny Green. I met him in the army. He was at, in the army as well at Fort oh. Bragg, North Carolina. So we started intro while we were in the army. Like we go to the recreation center. I played the piano and he would just be writing songs like really, really quick. And during that time, on vacation, I drive up to New York, and my friend had a studio in his house. So we go over to his house and start recording songs. And while we were there, this lady heard us, and she said, "You know, you guys should try to do this professionally." And we just, we just. But, stuck. but up to then, what, was it a case where it was just a fun thing, or what was what was going on between the two of you? Yeah, it was just, it was fun. Just making music was fun because he he loved to write songs, and I love to play music. Yeah. We didn't know anything about the business of music, you know. Was, was Kenny ever into? Did he ever think when he was in the army that okay, I want to become a professional singer or writer? Or was it just? Um, was... We was just we were just doing it at the time until people started telling us that, you know, you guys sound have a nice sound. You should go forward with it. So what yeah. was it like then in the army? It was Kenny would write stuff, <laughs> you would start playing, and would you perform to your to the to the, to the, to the... Um, they, they had local talent shows. Yeah. Yeah. So we there was this one place in particular, and every Wednesday they had a talent show with uh, I think it was like a hundred dollar prize and a trophy, okay. and the same girl would win every week, every week, and we kind of put our finger on it that it was an inside job, like they they did it so they could draw people in for the to pile it up, but they would always announce her as the winner, give her the same trophy. And who knows if they even gave her a hundred dollars? And we fought our way through it until the crowd was like undeniable. These guys are winning this show, but you keep giving it to her. So they started, you know, through applause, they end up having to give us the hundred dollars and the trophy one week. And you know, <laughs> they were, we were pretty much not welcome back there. <laughs> but but this was it within the army, or was this outside this, the army? This when we, we, no, it was outside the army base. It was a civilian club. It was called uh, called uh, Larry's. La Shaka Lounge in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay. I thought this was <laughs> after, after, after we started winning the talent shows, they canceled it because he didn't want to have to give somebody $100 and wow. a new trophy every week. Wow. So, so yeah. it, it, when you guys, would, would you just play and then Kenny would sing? Um, during that time, we started doing our own tracks. Like there was somebody who had a studio in the barracks as well, in the army barracks. Yeah. So I would go there and I would lay down the music and we would sing to the recorded music. Okay. Wow. And um, when you guys were winning, uh, getting people applauding and stuff, mm-hmm. that, to you, this was just fun. We're back in the army. We're doing our thing. And then when we get out, we're just yeah. 
go into civilian life? And was that what, or was there any other thought? I thought I was going to be in the army for 20 years. You know, okay. I had, when I went into the military, I was planning on making it a career. And um, once the war broke out and everything, I kind of saw like that life really wasn't for me. And then at the same time, the music has started coming up. And um, I came across a female artist named Layla Hathaway. I came across oh, this yeah. her yeah. cassette. Not the Donna Hathaway. Is she related to Donna Hathaway? That's his daughter. Okay, okay, okay. She is phenomenal. Layla Hathaway. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, I said, she sounds like Kenny or Kenny sounds like her. I think we could really do this professionally if we wanted to. So, um, but we didn't know anybody in the music industry. We didn't have any connections, you know, and it just so happened by chance, you know, that we started meeting people. Yeah. So do you, do you both come out at the same time from the army? Do you both quit at the same time or do you go first and then he follows or what, what was the, how was, what was the problem? Um, Kenny left the military about six months before I did. Okay. And he left right before the war started. I got deployed. I had to go to um, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. When I came back, Kenny had left North Carolina and went back home. And I didn't have any contacts from him at all. I didn't know where to find him or nothing. It took me like about three or four months once I got back to get back in touch with him. Yeah. Okay. And um, but when you got back, you, you went back to your folks' house in New York? Um, yes. I moved back okay. in with mom. Yep. And then when you got home, did you then start thinking, because I, I would all assume that New York had more music connections than anywhere else. Was it easy to, to start making connections or? Well, while, while I was still in the army, we came up to New York and we met Heavy D. Oh. God bless Heavy D. You know, we, we met Heavy D in a club and we sang for him. And he took our phone number and he called us while I was still back in North Carolina in the army to come up to New York to meet with DJ Eddie F. So we came up and we met with DJ Eddie F and that's when he offered us um, a recording contract. But by this time was Heavy not the president of Uptown or was he not vice president of Uptown? No, he, he, was, no, he wasn't the president at that time. He was, um, it was still Andre Harrell. Like okay. this was like 1991. 91, okay, so Andre. But then why didn't he take it to Uptown? Um, Cause they had Joe Dusty. Ah. Yeah, they, they had Jodeci at that time. Okay. And uh, Devontae well, guys... to sign the Swing Mob, but um, Untouchables wanted us to, to sign with their um, production company. So uh, you've got Devante, who was probably one of the best producers at the time, the hardest mm -hmm. producers at the time, and you had Eddie F, um, who hadn't done many not things that were not um you know he, untouchables grew after um after the mary stuff but it wasn't mm -hmm. as big at that time what made right. you pick eddie f over Devante? um because we had already met with eddie and agreed that you know we were going to sign with untouchables we didn't meet Devante until probably months after we met eddie we met Devante through eddie so we were in you know say all right thank you but we're gonna go work for this guy okay yeah, okay so. So um, did, when you performed for for Eddie, um, did he did he have a did he did you did you guys already have the name of of the group? Yeah, we we came to Eddie S intro because pr prior to meeting Eddie, um, there was a guy in New York, a Russian guy named Ed Goldsman. He had a house music label, so he brought us into his studio to record a house music song. And it was called Under Your Spell. It's still on the internet somewhere. Intro, Under Your Spell. And he put it out. We, you know, we just signed the paperwork. We didn't know what we were signing or whatever. <laughs> we just let him put it out. And um, he wouldn't let us do R&B music because he wanted to do just house music, house music, house music. I finally convinced him to let us do two R&B records. So I produced two R&B records with him. And that's when we met Eddie F. Like... During that time while we were still signed with, with Ed Goldsman, we met Heavy D, who introduced us to Eddie F. And I didn't tell Eddie F that we already had a contract with this guy, Ed Goldsman. So I went to Ed Goldsman and we pretty much, we didn't explain to him that we were going to sign with another label. We pretty much told him that we were breaking up. We didn't want to work together anymore. He was like, oh, this is so unfortunate. And he signed us out of the deal. He released us from his label. And then that's when we were able to go on and do rhythm and blues music with um. 
heavy D and I'm Eddie F. Now, at that point, so you, could you mention the, a very crucial thing that a lot of my guests keep saying is about the business side of the music side. So there's a mm. talent and then there's the business side. Oh, yeah. You signed with Ed, did you, so you, he could have had, taken everything that you've written and own it and you wouldn't have known? Well, yeah. Th those three songs that we have, that we did with him, the house music record and yeah. the two rhythm and blues songs, he has them on iTunes now and he makes every penny from them. We don't make a single penny. That was the agreement that we made with him, but we didn't know. You know, at this point, we're, we're in the army. We, you know, just doing it pretty much for the fun of it. Yeah. But And and uh, then did did you then, had, what, did you then, when you when ADF presents you with a contract, do you then, are you obliged to get legal advice? Uh, and not just because of ADF, but any type of contract, or you just sign right there? Oh, no, you have to give it to an attorney. They, their attorney sends it, their attorney sent it to our attorney. And um, how do we find our attorney? Yeah. Through them. Because we didn't know anything. So we <laughs> pretty much let them pick the attorney. So he's sending it to his friend, and they just work out whatever it takes to make the deal happen, you know. So <laughs> I, I, I interviewed um, Tabitha Duncan from, from Cut Close, and she said that Tabitha, yeah. you, you, you get... Uh, they give you, you get an attorney and they all know each other. They all, they all know uh, each other. They yeah. all know each other. I, I interviewed Don Robinson from Vogue and she said, I know an, a, an attorney that you might get might say, well, if I try and side my client against the record label, I'm not going to, I've got other clients there that they may say, well, we're not going to work with you again. So they're not, as much as they'll try and do fair advice, they're not going to be always in your corner. Yeah, because the groups come and go. You know, the label is there. They need that business from the label. So, yeah. yeah. But, but did you sign a, a deal that was for for the, for the time? Was it a fair deal, or was it really bad, or what, what was your um, when you re reflection? It was it was a standard R and B deal during that time. I think every R and B artist that I speak to that came through that through that era, like the '90s, like '92, '93, '94. It was pretty much the, the same contract. The only difference would be the the advance up front, like what money, how much money they would advance you up front, which is nothing more than a loan because you have to pay that back before yeah. you start seeing your royalty money. So with certain artists, they would get like maybe $50,000. And then you have another artist that may only get $5,000. Yeah. And uh, that was just up to the label and how much they believed in the project and how much you know they were going to put behind it. So, so and uh, so, um, up, um, Eddie F's label was um, had an uh, an outlet with Atlantic, Warner yes. Brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. when he signs you, does he need to go to Atlantic to say this is who I've got, and they have to audition you to say yeah we're going to put you guys out, or he signs you and they just take take it? Or yeah, yeah at this point. Um, we were signed to Untouchables, so technically, Untouchables had to deal with Atlantic. Yeah. My intro on album one. Then, with the success of album one, then Atlantic brought us from Untouchables, and we signed directly to Atlantic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, we, we'll, um, I'm maybe be sure I don't miss anything. So, when you go from Untouchables to Atlantic, are you able to renegotiate your contract because you've, you've got you've got um, you've got some leverage because you've had a very successful first album. Are you able to then get better right. terms? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a totally, uh, totally different deal, totally different deal than the first deal. Okay. Yeah. And, and at that point, are you able to get an attorney that you trust that's like, let's look at what's going on? Or Same guy. Same guy. <laughs> okay. Same guy. <laughs> okay. Hey, Mike Pantleone, if you're watching, how you doing? <laughs> He's traveling the world. I see him on his Facebook page. He's, he's traveling the world, having a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, and, you, and it's good to clear it up because you, um, because yeah, we've we've been hearing so many sad horror stories from the '90s. That, um, uh, but it's good that at least you guys had a better opportunity after the second album. One thing I can say about um, the Untouchables, about Eddie F, is he set us up pretty cool. He signed us up with the um, like ASCAP. You know, that's the Songwriting Society to collect yeah. our money for us. Um, American Federation for TV and Radio Artists, AFTRA. 
So they have like retirement funds and stuff like that. And when I speak to different artists, a lot of them don't have that stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, man, and I, uh, you know, I, I just stopped talking about it now because I don't want them to feel bad, you know, like why didn't, why didn't, why weren't they giving that stuff? But they, um, I think our deal was pretty fair. You know, yeah. I think I'm one of the artists that could say we put, we kind of got a kind of, of a fair deal. It, it could have been better. It could always be better. Yeah. But, but you know, and I would say that I've not heard any anything negative about ADF, and I know he's he's into a lot of it, into investments and stuff right now. Yeah. And, and and I think the fact that you said he did sign you up to have your own publishing and stuff um, mm-hmm. is is very admirable because most people who had deals, um, labels, little production deals, were looking to say. We got robbed when we when we signed up, so we need to recoup our money through our little acts of our acts. But it was good that you know he, he set you guys up from day one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So here you guys are. You've got your name. You start recording uh, the, the first material now. One, how does family feel about? Okay, you've come out of the army and now you're signed mm-hmm. to a record deal. Did. Um, is, did they are they wondering if when you're going to be dealing uh, singing along with Fred Hammond or what was there? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> not really. Like like my mom, she was happy that I was out of the army because um, during the war, I'm sure she was like a nervous wreck. Yeah. So she was number one. She was just happy that I was out the army. Um, she um, well, it was my sister. My sister was really supportive, but at the same time, she wanted me to get a real job. You know, she's like, this music is fun, but, you know, you should, you should think about getting a real job. So um, it, it just so happened that um, I was probably home for about two months without without the contract being kicked in and us receiving money. So I wasn't like laying around the house for a couple of years and hoping that, you know, this was going to happen. It just was um, just by luck, you know, by luck. It was time for me to leave the military. And the music was right there. Wow. And I always say that's pretty much one of the things that saved me because I have a lot of friends that came out of the army with me that got some stuff going on, you know, yeah. kind of stuff that they saw. But I never experienced it, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a mental health therapist here in the UK. And so the PTSD and, and yeah. the depression, there is this, the, the sense of structure that the military does give, discipline, this routine. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine when you come out of that, if you don't have a purpose and a focus, you can be lost. And that camaraderie you'd have with friends and, and stuff because everyone's busy. I can imagine how yeah. that lifestyle can 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 really be um, be cause problems. Mm. What what would be, was music then the driving focus for you? Because that's that you know you're, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. You're dealing with a lot of creativity a lot of work was that become that became like how are we going to get uh, this off how are we going yeah, to come that, up that, that that became our number one focus Kenny moved to New York and um we worked almost every day we were in the studio with somebody every day Jeff Red, Shinehead, Mary J Blige, Christopher Williams, Winans you know every seemed like if we wasn't working on our album we were at another studio working on somebody else's album. It's a lot of groups that came out in the 90s yeah. that have songs from us. So a lot of songs out there have intro actually singing their background for them. So, and that's how they like, was able to, to catch on and stuff. Yeah. So if we if we go through that then, because what when you when Eddie, when you get signed, um, did they tell you, okay, start working on on your album? Or what, what how what 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 are those early days like then or weeks? Um, we go to Dave Hall's house, um, Navelle Hodge house. They oh, all lived well. in Mount Vernon during the time. Okay. So we just drive up to Mount Vernon and whoever was available that night, we go there and just write songs and we get a call like the next day, like, hey man, Puffy heard this song. He wants it for Mary. What, what do you think? He, he wants four songs from you guys. Four songs? And, yeah, he wanted four songs from us. Um, Love No Limit, My Love, Reminisce. And let me be the one. Let me be the one was written for Mary J. Blige, but she only had three slots left on the album, not four. So if she would have had that fourth slot, then yeah. she would have let me be the one as well on uh, what's the four one one album. So yeah. if you go back, I mean, you're talking about um, my, my love, um, reminisce, and what was the other one? Love no um, limit. Love no limit. Mm-hmm. 
they, I mean, you know, I've, I've done a poll tonight to say who was our favorite 90s R&B act. And we had Mary, Tony Braxton, Mariah, um, Whitney Houston, and um, and Mary's winning almost by 50%. So they, everyone acknowledges that, you know, in the 90s, she dominated, especially that first album and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're writing these songs and she's taken and, and, and they've given it to her. Do you guys feel like, man, they should be ours? Or were you like, well, wow, goodness, our stuff is out? What was going yeah, for you? That was it, pretty much that. Just glad to hear it on the radio because we hadn't had an album out yet. We never knew if Intro would ever have a song on the radio. Yeah. Like when, when she took those songs, we weren't even signed to Atlantic yet. We were still just signed to Untouchables. Um, we did a, a bunch of songs, and what Eddie did was on one Friday night, he invited the top, like the presidents from all of the labels, like Sylvia Roan and Gerald Busby, and wow, everybody that you could think of to his house for dinner. And the whole night, all he played was intro songs. <laughs> so that Monday, his phone was ringing, like because they had the the party, they remember the party, and they remember that music that they was hearing at the party. So they called him on on Monday, and like the a few days after Monday, I think it was that Thursday, he was like, "Um, you you guys got a deal at Atlantic, yeah." So he well, pretty much many, started what tracks did you have? That what what tracks were playing? Um, yeah, but like pretty much like "Love Thing," "Let Me Be the One." Um, we had "Ribbon" done at that time. No, we may not have had "Ribbon" done. We had songs that never were released. It's like. Um, Why Don't You Love Me? That's one of the earlier songs that we had done. And then songs that didn't make the album were, were playing at night. It was just stuff that we recorded. Yep. Wow. And so <laughs> what, the, did he, did he, how did he pick the better deal? You know, in Atlantic, he didn't, Sylvia, I mean, did he, he had all these guys. Yeah. But what made him decide? Did he say why he put chose Atlantic? Now that, that was, that was behind the scenes. But I know Kevin Whitley had something to do with it. Kevin Whitley was um, working at Columbia Records at the time. And he wanted to bring us to Columbia Records, right? Yeah. So Kevin was able to negotiate a deal for himself at Atlantic Records, as long as he brought, you know, he's bringing intro with him to Atlantic Records. Okay. So okay. I think that's how it went. I think that's how it went. I'm not sure because I think he was there with in Vogue. So yeah, I can't, I can't validate that story. That's a story that I heard, but I, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> but in a, in a sense, I think when you do have open up a bidding war, you can get, you know, cause you know, it, Atlantic didn't have who, when you guys got signed, even with ADF onto Atlantic, who, who, any, who, who were the R&B acts that they um, had? The R&B acts they had was um, Rude Boys. Oh yeah, Rude Boys, okay. And Levert. So okay, so they were they were in in a sense they were very different from you guys, and and I can see why there the, there was a different market for, mm -hmm. for, for, for promoting you guys, um, and I, and I want to go back because the fact that you guys were signed to Abscat and you had your own publishing stuff that early on, it meant that the success for the four one one album meant success for you guys. Did you was was yeah. that the case? Yeah. Well, what we did was we we, we were going to do different publishing deals. So Kenny took the credit on the Mary J. Blige songs. And he got the publishing deal and we split the money on that. And then I was going to do a publishing deal and then we would split the money on that. But the problem with that was the first publishing deal that went down, you know, I, it wasn't, it didn't go down like we really wanted it to. Like we kind of got tricked and I, and I, I, I don't have no problem giving the numbers. For instance, they call us in. It's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to sign. We're going to do this publishing deal. Um, <clears throat> We're gonna give you guys up front seventy thousand dollars, but well, we need to do the deal today. Boom, did the deal for seventy thousand um, dollars, advance right. Mm. About two weeks later, the quarter the quarter breaks and the numbers come in from the album. So had we not did it for seventy thousand dollars, we could have did it for like two hundred thousand dollars, but we didn't know the business, and nobody told us that. So that kind of shunned us away from doing more publishing deals. So that's how I end up just owning my own publishing and end up like, I'm going to learn this thing. And right now I own the same amount of publishing on Come Inside that the record company does because I wouldn't relinquish it. I wouldn't give it up. So, okay. Yeah. So, but Kenny did for the first set and, and you, yours was supposed to be on the second. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. he understood, yeah. you know, he wasn't mad about it. 
Yeah, but it, it's it's one of the sad things that we 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 are learning about how, um, you know, the um that no matter who, you, unless in those days, if you didn't have a label, you you didn't have iTunes, you didn't have all the internet, you couldn't, you needed them to go through, and it it's either our way or no way and and stuff and yeah. um, but you know, but anyway, it but the good thing is that um, you guys are working, you're doing. Um, the merry stuff. What, what are, where, where else did we hear your your your, your tracks? Because um, I know Dave Hall was uh-huh. Dave was doing yeah. a lot of stuff in the veil. Real seduction. Um, well, we hung out with SWV a lot in the studio, but we didn't do any writing on their album. We just we go to their sessions and hang out with them. Um, let me see. We were in the studio pretty much every day with Donnell Jones. Horace Brown, you know, all those cats right there. We just all gel together. It's a lot of records that they helped us with. Like Little Joe from the Root Boys, he, he will help us with records. There's a lot of records out there that where writers should be listed and they're not listed. And that goes for our songs and as well as like other people's songs. You know, they call it ghost writing. But you just go in and you're helping your friends out to make hit records and, you know. But then who, 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 who owns it and who gets the money from it? The, the artist. Yeah, the, the actual artist. Whoever owns the publishing, then it would it would go to them. Okay, so but that's then, not in every song, but there are just certain songs. You know, there's a few songs out there that we didn't that we don't have our names on. Yeah. But um, okay, but it it was more so you, you guys were honing your craft. Were you learning the business as very quickly from 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 that from from then on? Um, we thought we were, but the business changes like it changes like that. So um, they threw us out on the road. We, we toured for two years. And by the time we came back home, it was like, where's the money? You know, we were making money from the road more than we've ever made in our lives. So it wasn't like, where's the money? Because my family's not eating and we're not doing this. You know, it was like, okay, we'll deal with that when we, when we deal with it, when we start seeing our royalty statements. So it was for years before we even saw our first royalty statement. And to find out, you know, it, it wasn't, this is how much money is owed to you. It was saying, this is how much money is owed to us. And that's how they kind of, that's how they drew up those contracts. It's a lot of stuff that I, I, I want to talk about, but within uh, two months from now, we have a movie being released. It's okay. called, yeah, Intro, Music, Lyrics, Music, Life, and Lyrics. So I, I don't want to give it all. No, 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 you know, no, 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 I, no, no. With you. Uh, yeah, no, I think more so just the... It's and I, need just, their, I don't want to talk too bad about you-know-who because I need their participation. I need their participation yeah, because... Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing a soundtrack for yeah. the movie. One of the music group is doing a soundtrack for the movie, and then they're going to release another intro album during Black Music Month in June. Okay. So, no, so no. We, we, yeah. yeah. Uh, to Jake no. Nevin. Yeah. <laughs> in the flicks films. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> I think uh, uh, what, we're, what I was getting more so is just the, the fact that and it's not particularly any particular people that you work mm-hmm. with. It's just the, the 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 what we've noticed over the time is that how hard it is to be talented, to have talent. Yeah. And it it doesn't seem like if you did baseball, if you did uh, football, you know, it seems very standard in in, in sports. You know, here's your contract. Here's yep. what your bonuses and upfront and everything. So you've got your agent who who tries to get more for you because the more you get the more they get and it seems if there's there's a lot of protection there somehow um in the music industry it's very different it almost seems that the more talent you have the more it's how can we take as much from you yeah and, because, and, and that's a sad thing that we are noticing so they, they know it's a passion and that you'll do it even if you're not getting paid for it because once something becomes passionate to you, you're going to do it anyway. You're going to sing in the shower. You're going to sing, you know, around the house. And so a lot of people pretty much will just take whatever whatever is given to them. If it's more than a, nothing, then they'll just take it. And, but um, if you had gone pro, pro baseball mm-hmm. and you, you you love baseball, you know, the Bruins or, or, or the, the, the Hawks uh, sorry, or the um, Braves aren't just going to sign. They're going to say, well, we'll give him just a penny because he loves right. baseball. They, they would say this is an asset. We need to yeah. protect the asset. It's, you know, with the music business, it's been like that forever, forever. And, um, 
you know, now the artists have, they have, you know, more of an opportunity of controlling their, their careers and their music and stuff. Yeah. But it's honestly, it's just a matter of time before they find a way to, you know, to, break to, get, to get through that. Yeah. So if we go to the first album now, um, what was the, how, when did they say, okay, it's time to start working on the first album because you, you, you're doing stuff, you gave stuff to Mary, you were doing ghostwriting. When is this like, okay, we need you guys to start working on the first album? Um, we ended up just having an album done by recording so many songs. We had probably recorded like 40 songs. 40 and, um, songs that you actually like 40, sang, like that 40. you actually recorded and sang and it was like. Mm -hmm. and, and we would turn them over to the label and they put them in the vault because they gave us a recording budget. So we would turn songs over to them and they would hold them in the vault. And how we picked the songs for the first intro album was at Eddie F house on his back porch, smoking a blunt with Super Cat, the <laughs> reggae yeah. artist, Super Cat. As, as one would do in the 90s, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Super Cat pretty much picked the album, the songs on, the first, on our first album. How? We don't know. He just was there, like, yeah, that one right there, man. Yeah. yeah, that one right there, that one. So we was just writing it down, all right, love thing. Okay, let me be the one. Okay, one of a kind of love. And that's pretty much how out of those 40 songs, we picked the 11 songs I think we had on um, on the intro album. Okay, but then <laughs> did you have an A&R person? I would have thought that that's what they normally do. And, and, and Yeah, that, that was that was Kevin Woodley. He, he didn't push back on anything that we did because we were coming with a whole new sound. So he wasn't, he didn't know either. He didn't know what Atlantic Records wasn't ready for what we gave them. They, they didn't, they never seen anything like it before. The hip hop beats, like, so they've had records with hip hop beats on it for like four CDs and stuff like that. Yeah. But it was never like a whole album of this street music with singing on it. So they, they really didn't know, they trusted us. But um, he, he let us pick, yeah. Uh, and what, what about Eddie? Did he not get involved in picking or helping pick? Cause you know, that, that, that it was- He would have released all 40 of those songs if he could. He would have released all 40. Wow. You know, and, and then again, you know, behind the scenes, I'm sure it was a lot of talk and with back and forth with Eddie and the A&R at the label. Yeah. And, you know, because it, it was definitely was it the three of us that said, this is the album, take it, and that's it, you know. Wow. But they that, gave us a lot of freedom. And that especially when you, and, and I think there's the advantage of being in a label that doesn't have groups like yourself but then because you have the greatest freedom but then it's also the disadvantage where they're not used to knowing how to market you so would have been different if you think when you look back if you were assigned to Uptown and no Jodeci and they do and Mary would you think you'd have been any different as a, as a, as a group? Um, I think if we were signed to Uptown we would have been more popular we would have sold more records but I'm not sure we would have made more money. I'm not okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the deal might not have been as good as the yeah, negotiation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a corporation, and they, you know they're going to be here forever, pretty much. So yeah. they have a reputation to uphold. So they're not going to do but so much, you know, to you, you know. Yeah. So you have forty songs, and they're sending it to the votes vaults. Mm -hmm. Um. I think a lot of us are learning about what they call masters. And does that mean that those 40 songs don't belong to you anymore? Right. They, the label owns those songs. They have the right to do whatever they want with those songs. And when you're sending them 40 songs, did you know that that's the case, that we're sending them the songs and they own it? And it's like, I've just painted, I've done a pie and it mm -hmm. goes back to the view. Did you have an idea or what was your... Well, they, they were paying for it. You know, there's paying right by right. There's paying the studio time. You know, they were paying us and, you know, that was our job to turn over songs at that time. So okay. we have them there and we can still release them if we want to and collect our publishing money. Like that's what's going to happen with the album in June. They're going to pull songs from the vault and remaster them and okay. put those out. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah. So on reflection though, would you have thought, okay, we've got these songs. We can keep some of them. And we just turn over 15 songs mm -hmm. and we still keep the other 25. On reflection, knowing what you know now about the business, would you have done stuff like mm -hmm. that or would you sort of given them the 40? 
Right. Well, they have they have about 40 songs in the vault. And then there's another 40 or 50 songs just laying around producers' homes. Like I, I've been, I was on the phone with a producer the other day. He has three songs that he's going to submit for the movie soundtrack. You know, that's never been released. We never gave to the record company or anything. So, you know, there's still a lot of intro stuff. I go on the internet and come across unreleased music all the time from us. I don't know how it gets out there, but um, yeah. it's almost there's, a whole album out there of unreleased songs right now. Yeah, there's a friend of mine, um, um, Richard from The Grapevine, um, he, he's mm -hmm. on IG, and he, he told me about two songs, Put Put Me On. Yeah, Put Me On. A lot of people ask about Put Me On. Um, they want, they ask me, do I have it and can I send it to them? And I don't even have that record. Like, um, that's uh, Jonathan Morant and Eddie F. They, they have that record, Put Me On, in its entirety. And um, he may release it. Eddie might release it one day. Okay. I'm sure then, which he would. <laughs> um, but then who, does he own it or who owns it? Um, that song right there is, is just like a rogue song. We just recorded it. Nobody really owns it because we don't have a deal for that record. Like if Eddie was to put it out, then that would have to be a whole different um, agreement. Like, you know, on the points and how much, what, what are the splits on it? It's like coming over to a friend house and just recording a song. Okay. You know, that's okay. what happened pretty much. We were just there and the music is on and just, hey, let's do it. And um, that happened a lot. We got, we have a lot of songs out there. Very similar to what Prince would do, just record lots of music and stuff, but he, he, he'd keep hold of his stuff. What about those and how can yep. you, how can you? How can, yeah. How can you let me down? Yeah, it has a Jay Z beat underneath it. Can't can't knock the hustle. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. another one of them. Yeah. And and that's you don't know have that one, but that's out there. That's out there as well. I have that. I have that. I have, I just don't have put me on. I have I have how can how can. So, shoot, I might have been listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said. Oh yeah, here you go. You hear that? Yeah. How can how can you let me go? Is that you on the keys? Um no, that's on Rashad Rashad Smith. this and i'm thinking i missed the 90s um, because we don't, they, they don't they, no one no producers don't don't they're not non-innovative like this and stuff i mean that's that's <clears throat> I'm listening to to kenny and i it reminds me of diesel um daryl diesel adams from um yeah basic black, yeah, basic no. black the, 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 yeah basic black mainly but the could the there's there is there is such a um, I think like Luther has it, there is something powerful about how they sing that is very effortless. Yeah. You can't teach that. Um, yeah. there's, it comes you from, hear, from in here. Yeah, I'm listening to that. I'm saying, wow, that's, that's such a, the, the, I could hear pain and, and joy and truth in, in, in just, just that short, small clip. We have, we have songs that, I mean, if somebody, if there was a label to put an album together like right now, like it's coming in June, 
But um, I, I mean, I think we missed a lot of years of not putting out good music and stuff. Yeah, but then, okay, so, okay, it kind of threw me because there's that's very really good tracks. So your, your first album, you 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 pick up your your eleven eleven tracks and stuff, and um, were you guys then prepared because you were doing a lot of behind the stuff, seeing stuff, and now you have to do your photos and promos, shoot a video and stuff. What was that like back in that early time? That was, that was a fun experience for us, um, shooting music videos. I remember the first video that we did was um, Shinehead, Try My Love. So we kind of kind of got a taste of what, what it's like to be on a video set and how much yeah. fun he was having and stuff. A couple of weeks later, we shot the video for um, Love Thing. Ooh. It was freezing cold outside. It was super <laughs> and, um, you know, the, all the trucks there and the food and the people and knowing that, you know, we get ready to create something to share with the world. That was fun. Then we did Let Me Be The One video in Atlanta. Mm. Um, then it was uh, Come Inside video, which is we did here in New York. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> then off to California to do Ribbon In The Sky video. So it was just like. So I, I, put, out the, um, I put out the little poll um, and I put Let Me Be The One, Funny How Time Flies, Come Inside, Love Thing, and Feels Like The First Time. And Come Inside, had you know this uh, 1200 votes in uh, within the last six hours was 50 wow. percent of the people preferred come inside as their one of their favorite intro tracks although That's i didn't awesome. put rhythm in the sky because okay. i didn't i know it was a stevie cover and back in the day everyone did a stevie cover you had to do a stevie cover yeah uh, and, I, and i and and sometimes if you put a stevie cover it would it would skew the votes my favorite is probably feels like the first time it's probably um, emotionally, it feels probably one of the what, what a very emotional track um, mm -hmm. uh, um, and stuff. But how was how was the the reception of the first album? Because yeah, you know, you guys were very distinct, very different. Mm -hmm. No one would ever, you know, you know, Jodeci were doing their thing, Blackstreet Boys to Men, everyone mm -hmm. was doing their thing, um, Drew Hill and and but you guys were very much. Mm -hmm in a very different lane that everyone would say, oh, intro. What was it, what was it like when you guys came out as a group? Did you, could you feel that people gave you respect? Uh -huh. and being we, had some, we had good love on the streets. That's, that's how I used to always put it. You know, a lot of people from in, in, the, in, the, in the pretty much lower income neighborhoods showed us a lot of love because I guess they could relate with, our, with the stories in the record, you know. Um, and then it'd be surprising, surprisingly crowds. Like we ended up at the um, Wrigley Mansion in Arizona. That's the people who um, made oh, Rick the Spearman gum. Yeah, you know, the cup, yeah. at their house with friends with them and like the Dome's backache pills people, their wow. intro fans, wow. you know? So it was like, it's kind of, it was really diverse. And um, we had a lot of um, like uh, football players would invite us to perform at their um, parties that they would have, you know? Super Bowl parties and stuff like that. Wow. Because it was really a really fun time, really good time. So that first album was, it was, um, it, it kind of caught on really quick. What did it do? Did it go platinum? It went way past platinum. But if you go on the RIAA, they're going to still have it listed as gold. Yeah. So that's one of those things back over there. Yeah. yeah. Why, why, why was that? Because uh, why, why would they have two different different figures? Why would Atlantic um, not be proud to say I you think got once a you go, once they acknowledge that you platinum, it comes with a bonus. It comes with a bonus check. So that number will always probably stay at 999,999. You know, 999. It, 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 that number will probably never go to 1 million. Unless, what would, what, what would be the case where they can't hold it I, back? I don't, I don't have that answer. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's a phone call. It's, it's really just a quick email to say, um, what, are our, what are our total numbers? Like, I get, I get our royalty statements and stuff, but it's now it's, everything is in streams, not units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying that, but Atlantic, we're like, well, this, we've got a hot product here that we want to take on because they, it, it shows that you, you had a lane. It did well and it did, yeah, but pla and I knew it couldn't have just gone gold, even though you just have a gold plaque, but it did, everyone had a copy of it. Yeah, everybody so. had a copy of this thing all, all around the world. I'm like, yeah. yeah. 
I think one of the things that I, I, I've, I've, that sort of vexed me um, and, 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 um, was the fact that um, Intro um, and SWV um, had a main lead singer. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I think I struggled, to me personally, I don't know about it, the fact that there's a lot of, even Hatestown had Dino, it was that sense of we're mm-hmm. investing in our lead singer to do all the singing and, you know, uh, it's like if they don't run out, if they don't call it quits and stuff, we've got a group for life. But if they decide, yeah, you know, my vocals have gone, we're so used to just the one singer. When you guys were performing, the three of you, did you did you not say, well, if we let Kenny, even though he's far, far better, better singer, if we don't chip in every now and then singing a lead or, or stuff, it, it might just be the Kenny Green show. Mm-hmm. Well, after the first album, like the industry at that time, they had a pattern of they would put groups out and then they would take the lead singer and do a solo album. And then maybe the group would come back together. Maybe they wouldn't. Yeah, That was like a pattern that was going on. So I was encouraging Kenny after the first album to do a Kenny Green album. He wow. He didn't want to do it. Yeah, he, he, didn't, he didn't want to do it. Yeah, I was encouraging him because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not the music friends, it's the music business. And I saw where that would have just done phenomenal. It would have been like a, a Will Downing or a Luther Vandross, you know. And I yeah. felt that, I felt the world needed that. But uh, yeah. And, and I, but I, you I, you have been involved in helping write and produce and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like it would have been just some of those from those songs that we did already because he was already singing leads. It was it would have been as simple as just handing the songs over. And doing yeah. packaging, yeah, yeah. But um, what was his he- what was his hesitation for 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 doing that? I think we were having too much fun, pretty much. I think we were just having too much fun, you know, as a group traveling, and you know, that came like it came like a brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. but then again, it's 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 not everyone that that's um, that has you know. You think of you, you talk about new edition and Bobby was he, he could do it seamlessly, but you could see Ralph initially struggled with that. So, okay, do I go solo? Cause I'm so used to being with the fellas and it, it didn't seem like that. Um, so then you guys go directly to with Atlantic and start working on your follow-up album. Um, was there pressure from you guys to sophomore album? Cause that's sometimes back in those days, it could be the pressure album. Um. <clears throat> It, there was, but Kenny's father passed away, like right when we got the budget to do the album. So it turned from a follow-up album to almost like a dedication album to his father. Like we don't look at New Life as the second intro album. We kind of look at New Life as an inspirational record. That's why they don't have like the, they have Funny How Time Flies on there and um, Strung Out On Your Love, but we don't have like the love thing or Let Me Be The One type of records throughout there. Because it's mostly, pretty much every one of those songs is about Kenny's father. Wow. Yeah. There's a way, spending my life with you, new life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell me how, okay. We had to um, do our, our Come Inside. We had to have a follow-up for Come Inside. So that's why we did um, Feels Like the First Time with good. Novell Hodge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it was, it, that was, as I say, it was, well, it's probably my favorite intro song um, mm-hmm. because there's, there's a very um, passionate um, song um, and so that, that affected the writing and, and what you wrote about um, as, and as a group you guys were supportive of that it wasn't like no nah, man we need to do oh no nah, I, was, I, was, I was fine with that I was 100% fine with it yeah. and, and the label were, were they did they they trusted you the first time they just said yeah whatever you want to do or what was yeah, that they just, like, give them we, we sat in a meeting with them and it's like give, pretty much give them whatever they want they gave us way over half a million dollars to record that second album. We didn't need that much money. But, um, <laughs> what, what happens yeah. with the money, though? Did they just say, here's the money? Here's and the then money. You, just... you got, yeah, do what you got to do. Just make sure you do what you got to do. You know, you can't just take the money and not turn over the, the product. Yeah. But then, you, you, so, you so they, they give you the big, big advance and, and at least that, that just, that's, it was, that, that makes you guys a lot more comfortable when you, you and uh, when you record, but you're not wasting it. I, 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 nah, 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 no, 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 no. 
we, we had a business manager, you know, so when we had, when we need studio time, they PO the money to the, to the studio. It wasn't like we could go with an ATM card and pull the money <laughs> okay. out. I'm going to take out a couple thousand dollars today to do okay. this. No, but we, then- we set aside individual like advances, like each member would get like $10,000 you know, to help with the living expenses and stuff. Yeah. Because during that time, we weren't on the road, so. Okay, okay. Now, uh, just before we move on, to the, the the touring, because what I'm hearing from when I interview members of groups is that you don't make as much as a group from album sales, but it's really the touring that really is where the income was that, mm-hmm. unless you, you have publishing. But what did you find back in those early days? Yeah, that, that was the primary source of income, um, doing the shows. Yeah, doing the shows. Because um, your check from the label, if you're getting a check, it comes once every four months. There's like a quarterly. Okay. But with the shows, if you're working like every week, every week, you know, sometimes two, three, four shows a week. I was coming home. I, I had problems with the money. I used to have people have to have people meet me to bring money home for me and stuff like that. It was it was ridiculous. From the <laughs> was, shows. Yeah. I was like I called my brother, like, can you please fly? We're gonna be in Philadelphia on this day. Can you please meet me here? I need you to take something home for me. Because a lot of those shows were paid in cash because Why? the promoters don't want to pay, you know, taxes know, and all that stuff. stuff. You know, it's a lot, a lot of cash stuff, you know. I know the FBI and IRS is watching, but I took care of my yeah, taxes. Yeah. I, my taxes. <laughs> I do remember, oh, was it Mary that said that when she did the track for Method Man, oh, Method Man did, she did track for Method Man, they paid mm-hmm. it in cash, and yeah, she was a little bit freaked out about it, but, um, mm-hmm. and she said it in an interview, but but what you're saying is that um, there's there's a lot of, wow, so that that's, um, was quite interesting. So. Hence, the, there's the need to be on tour quite a bit. But then, were you guys comfortable being on the road and being on tour, or would you prefer being in the studio? What was it for you guys? Um, we we liked the road until it, until you got tired. You know, it's fun traveling and seeing different parts of the world and places that you've never seen before. And um, what we did was we put our studio on our tour bus, so we were still able to to work and stuff like that. Yeah. But at, at time, as time went on and you kind of get tired of being around each other all the time you know you yeah. kind of definitely need a break and just want to go home and and eat food out the kitchen and stuff and you know so when you in between the time when um, your first album comes out and and and, and the follow-up um and you're promoting going on tour were you still then after the success of what you did for mary were you still turning in records for other artists um more, more, more so Kenny, because once they saw the success of the Mary J. Blige album, they would start flying him to different studios. Like Will, he did a record with Will Smith. Um, he did a record with A. Z. Um, there's a, a couple of other different artists. Yeah, but they, 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 because Kenny's name was on on there, they thought he was the sole person. And, and what about yourself? Man, I had to for come inside. They was gonna put come inside out without my name on it. And if you look, if there's some CDs that's floating around where it just says written by Kenny Green, or if you go on some platform, it just says written by Kenny Green, Kenny Green. And I, I had to really fight with the label. Like I was getting the money for it and I had my publishing, but the written credit wasn't on there. It's like, well, he's a bigger songwriter. Just let's just put his name on. I was like, no, that's not how it's gonna work because I need to get credit too, because that's yeah. how people are gonna come to me to write songs. Yeah. So if they finally put it on there, and that's like <laughs> you know, yeah. Paul McCartney said the same thing um about it was Lennon McCarthy, Lennon McCarthy on all their tracks, but he wrote yesterday on his own. And he asked John Lennon, says, look, is it possible that this is the song I wrote? Can we do McCartney Lennon for this track? And he says, no, it's always no. going to be Lennon McCartney. And so they, they had a fallen out over that, but it, it, it was how it was. But there, there was that importance of, well, I, I did all this stuff and I wanted it to be my, I want to put my name first. Um, but this wasn't anything with Kenny. He didn't say no I'm my, my stuff this was more the label uh, yeah, it, was more the label. it was never kidding it was always the label and, okay yeah. um, but when he was going to, for doing the AZ stuff were you also getting calls to do writing and stuff as well um yeah I did um a couple of things I did um 
Terrell Hicks. She was in the movie The Bronx Tale. I know Terrell Hicks. I know, I know her Distant Lover. Uh, you know, Sprog. Yeah, Distant Lover is one of my favorite from her from her first album. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I put together her demo that she went over to Sony Records with at, um, Tommy Matola signed her there. Okay. Um, I did um, John Legend's mother's album. She does gospel. So I fell back and started doing gospel production again. Her name is Phyllis Stevens. So I, I did an album with her. She actually came up to my house for like two weeks. Wow. And um, that's pretty much been it. <laughs> Besides me writing, I probably got like a thousand songs in here. This is my studio right here. I don't know if you can see it or not. Let me turn this it's pretty much okay. where I, I spend my days at down here. Um, you can't really see it. But. Yeah, no, you've got your piano there. You've got um, your speakers in there and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm so. The new stuff. Pardon? I'll, I'll send you some of the new music as well. Yeah, no, most, no, definitely. But then, so the, 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 the album comes up. Whose idea was it to do Remnant in the Sky? Uh, Tim Patterson. He was a guy named Tim Patterson. He worked with Intro. He worked with Jodeci. He signed uh, the Lost Boys to uh, Uptown Records. Okay. And he, was, like, he was like our artist development guy. And he was like, you guys need to do a uh, Stevie Wonder song. <laughs> Stevie we're, Wonder the sky. Song. <laughs> we're, like, we're not doing a Stevie Wonder song. We're, we're doing it. Too much work. We don't want to do it. And he kept pressuring us and pressuring us. And finally, we recorded the song. Yeah. I mean, at that time, everyone had to do a Stevie song on the album. Black Street, mm -hmm. everyone had to do it. But it was probably... Was it one of your bigger crossover hits? It was definitely the biggest crossover hit. Yeah. We didn't release it as a single at first, so that's what took the album gold. Because people, they could buy Let Me Be The One and Love Thing as a single. But if you wanted Rhythm In The Sky, you had to actually buy the CD or the cassette. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's what they were doing to some of, the, that's what the labels were doing back in those days mm -hmm. to, to really push the stuff. Um, but then after the second album, and, and, and stuff, what, what goes, what happens in between? Were you then working on doing a third or what, what, what was, what happened? Um, after we released the second album, we did two videos. We did um, Funny How Time Flies, Feels Like the First Time. Then there was something like a falling out between our manager and somebody at the label or between Kenny and somebody at the label. We never got the story of what happened, but there was some sort of falling out and to the point where Atlantic Records was like, we're just gonna let, let you guys go and do whatever you want to do. We're gonna release you from your contract. So okay. from then we did a, we did a, we toured for a little while longer. And then um, that was pretty much it. We just took a break, like Kenny moved back home. Um, it was a time where I hadn't spoke to them for like two years, two, two going on three years. And then um, somebody called and was like, I'm doing a compilation album. Um, we want to give you guys a budget to put a few songs on a, on the compilation. It was the clothing line, Fubu. Mm. So um, Kenny came back up to New York, and we started um, working on the third album, and um, probably recorded another 10, 15 songs then, mm. during that time. And then he stayed in New York, but we never got back to um, to doing shows or anything because at that time his health was failing. Yeah. So, but okay, I mean. Unless it's going to be addressed in a documentary, I'm 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 really fascinated how Atlantic had a, a group that were were consistent in creating quality tracks and 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 selling that it could be that easy without the three of you having a discussion to drop you. Um, did you guys not have a say in in that? Oh uh, no, nah, we we didn't have a say. It was a phone call and said you guys better sign this paper. Like, it wasn't like we were going to negotiate with them and say, um, let's talk about doing this. Let's talk about it. It was, that was it. See ya. So something happened behind the scenes. I don't know what it is. My guess is that they never received the masters, the master recordings for the second album. Because there's only a few songs from the second album that's in the vault. Like all those songs are not in the vault, like Love Me Better, New Life. Those songs were never turned over. And, um, yeah. and and who has them? You guys? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Those <laughs> okay. Are. okay. God bless his soul. He's gone now. Those songs went. The masters of those songs went with him. Who? Kenny or, or the man? Or the um, like, um, Kenny. Oh, with Kenny. Okay. But then, so when you guys get dropped, how does that affect the relationship with with the three of you? Um. 
Well, it really didn't because it wasn't like the first album. If it would have happened during the first album, we would have probably been devastated. But, you know, we had pretty much got it out of our system. We had an opportunity to travel the world, you know, make some money. I was able to buy my mother a house. So I kind of felt like I did everything that I set out to do. And everything else was just like icing on the cake, you know, just like in, in addition to it. So I kind of pretty much had to, had it, you know, almost out of my system. And then, you know what? I was dealing with the reality of knowing that, you know, that Kenny was sick and that, Unfortunately, it was as hard as I would pray, you know, history at that time taught me that he might not be along, might not be around for a long time. So I had already started conditioning my, my mind to that. Like, as we were recording the second album, I kind of knew that his health was fading. Oh, and so you knew by the second, Auburn, when, you knew when you were recording the second album that he, he had HIV? Pretty much. Um, I didn't, I didn't know for... He didn't tell me. I, I knew, but he didn't tell me. Like, oh, you can tell he, that he looked. He, he told looked. me when we came back to do the third album. That that's what he told me. What was but wrong? Prior he, to he, that, it was just a, it was just the elephant in the room. It was a secret, and you know, it was his business. I didn't I didn't want to mind it. You know, I was there for him if he needed anything, he needed help. But you know, it was some days where he wasn't feeling well enough to do too many things, and I I kind of knew that. Like at some point. I'm probably gonna have to say goodbye to this brother, you know, as, as sad as it was, like, I, I had to condition myself. Yeah. And because, because you're doing the second album as, a, as an inspiration for his dad, mm -hmm. but at the back of your mind, you're thinking maybe this is also for Kenny, but he exactly. hasn't said anything. Exactly. The song New Life, if you listen to the words in that song, it's almost like he, he knew he was going, you know, it's like that song. I think speaks for him because he was saying stuff like write a write a letter to the president. Now the dog's gonna pay my rent. It's gonna be all right. Let me stay for a while. Um I'm gonna get a new life, you know. So that new life was definitely for himself. Even though he mentioned his father's name in it, I kind of yeah. like he's talking about himself too. Because was like Martin, Malcolm, Elijah, and I think I heard him say. Nathan Kaiser, that's his father's name. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, wow. And, um, but yeah, but you could, be, at that point, you just let him, and I guess it's, it's hard unless you're in that situation to know how you respond if they're not saying anything and stuff. Yeah. You don't, I didn't want to ask him, you know, I didn't yeah. want to ask him because it's a chance I could be wrong and then, you know. Yeah. It was, you know, it was his business. And... Yeah. And then, so the album comes out. You, do you do you minimize your touring and your and stuff as a result um, of his health? Or yes. You just... mm -hmm. We we started taking less and less dates because physically it really it really wasn't possible to do so. Yeah. And so he he doesn't say anything, and no one <laughs> says anything. You just it's a lot don't... of stuff going around in the background, you know, people will say stuff to me like, what's what's up with your boy? How's he doing? Why, why does he look like that? And it's just an act. Like, you know, why don't you ask him? You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so, so oh, as this was, was going on, um, um, when did you, how, how after the first, second album is released that you come back for the third? What's the time frame? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Um, and so, then he he comes clean and stuff. How 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 do you take it? Um, the three of us were sitting there, and when he told us, we was just like, "Damn!" We said at the same time, we was like, "Damn!" And um, I didn't want to talk too much about it right there, but um, I called him the next day, and you know, told him you got my support, you know, one hundred percent, you know. And um, he said that he wanted to move back to New York because remember he just came back up to do the recordings. He was staying in the hotel, so I tell him, "Yo." If you want to move back up to New York, you're welcome to stay at my house. So I came back to New York, moved into my house. Um, I was married at the time and I had an infant kid. So my wife was just like nervous wreck because she didn't know anything about the disease. And she um, went to have different toothbrush places for toothbrushes and all this stuff. And, you know, but um, he lived with us for a few months before he um, had to go into the hospital. Yeah. Wow. How, that, I, I can't begin to imagine how um, <clears throat> the, the challenge with with, with that. Um, nasty. It's nasty. It's nasty. 
That's all I can say. When people ask me, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's nasty. It's a nasty way to go. Yeah. yeah. My um, my dad passed away last month with uh, COVID. Oh, sorry for your loss. Sorry and for your loss, man. Thanks. And he was in, in and unfortunately he was in the hospital, and he went in just for blood sugar, and then you know he caught the virus in the hospital and. Oh man. You know, each one week he was, they were saying he's fine, he's about to come home. Then it's like, oh, he's got COVID. And within a week, he just goes. And But we couldn't visit because there was, yeah. you couldn't go visit because they just, they didn't let anyone in. And I reflected on, you know, he died within a week of, of catching this disease, but it was a slow, and we got a chance to grieve and be shocked. But then, almost come over it and I, and I wonder the difference if it was a uh, three months or four months and and, and stuff but yeah, so I can't right yeah I kind of, yeah it, it's 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 definitely always going to be different for each of us and stuff um but do you guys even when you're staying with you guys do you do any inspiration to write anything or is it just talking yeah about as a matter of fact I just sent off to California on yesterday I sent uh, a bunch of these off. <clears throat> they, like we, we were recording songs on these zip drives. I had a couple of them and it said um, intro and it says Kenny. And um, yeah, I was using a machine called a Fostex F FD8. So I'd sent over two of them and they're going to transfer them for me back to Wave Files. And um, I'll probably have some good intro songs on there. Wow. Those, those were the songs during his during his final days, like during the, like where he was doing vocals laying down. We actually do vocals with him on the couch because he just wanted to continue recording My and goodness. just believe in messages and stuff. So I'm I'm anxious to see, you know, what's on those tapes. I'll have them back in like I guess two weeks or so. Wait, he what year did he die? He died in nineteen ninety one. A week after the September eleventh incident. About a few yeah. weeks later, October first, two uh, two thousand and one. Was it 2000? 1991, 99. No, no. two thousand and one. Two thousand one. The only reason I asked because it's twenty years and you've not listened to them. Mm -hmm. I haven't. Nope. Yeah, I don't have the machine. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, have, I don't have the machine to play them, so that's why I, um, I had to send them off to get transferred, and I can't find the machine anywhere for sale. I'm looking everywhere, so it's called Fostex. FD8. They have another brand now, but it's not the zip drive model. But you said you finally found someone who has it so you can get them get um, it out. Well, it's a tape conversion company. They they can do they said they can take them off to take the music off. Okay. So. Okay. Wow. Um so it, it, he it, so he 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 so he 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 passes and then the, the stuff that you record for the Fubu, did you did does they get released? Um no, they never got released. Never. Never. <laughs> I probably got I probably got some stuff on here. Let me see something. Uh, you hear that? Yeah. Who's on the piano? Baby, oh, oh what's his name? This is all I want to say. I get sad when you're not around. Oh man, what's his name? Take your love away, I'm feeling down. Like a kid I'm embarrassed to say I forgot his name. I never did enough. I got I think it is not you anymore. It's not me. Not to feel this way. I want you more every day. What is coming over me? Look what you've done. Baby, you got me. I am in my bed. How was it easy for him to just write like that? I 
the center of the line at the gate on my way to Los Angeles. Had a little time to spare, so I was headed out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how, um, how much we miss the music, but it's amazing how effortlessly it seems like it. Were you guys singing background or how, what, what happens to the... Kitty sung on those two songs that I just played. He did the backgrounds on those because those were just, we were just writing at the time. And um, yeah, just go ahead and go and knock it out. They weren't, not even really finished songs right there. But well, what about production? Who was producing it? Um, those tracks were presented to us. I want to say, um, let me see, what's the guy's name? Kenny, Kenny Love, somebody named, <clears throat> somebody named Kenny Love, and also um, Rashad Smith at Tumbling Dice. He did a lot of stuff like Biggie Smalls. And... Yeah. So what would they do is they would give you the sort of beats and then you, mm -hmm. and then you'd he would write over over them. Yeah. Okay. And put it on like two tracks of tape and then layer all the vocals underneath it like that. Wow. So you've kept them for all these years with them. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you would you guys ever planning to, you know, after Kenny passed, did you then think that's it? Inch was gone. There's nothing else because he was our lead singer. He was our main writer. That's it. Or you, you and Jeff, what did that's, you guys decide to do? That's 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 pretty much how I felt. It had been in back in my heart, I didn't want the legacy of Intro to be um, Intro stopped recording and doing music because Kenny died. I didn't want that to be the final you know, story at the, you know, the end. Kenny died, the end. So um, we tried putting new members in the group and that just didn't work out. It always would end up in some type of argument because they didn't understand the business. They thought they were coming to the group and automatically, like, we're going to be buying them cars and all of this stuff. I'm like, nah, that's not how it works. You know, you, we go, we do shows, and even though you're a new member in the group, I'm still going to split the money equally. I'm going to make the same amount of money as you make. And um, I would tell them like, okay, this is how much this show is for. And sometimes you go to do a show and then the promoters get a little janky on you. They always have some type of story. <clears throat> and um, oh, I had to spend a little bit more on here. So it was actually this amount of money and they would give that to me. Now I already told the guys in the group, okay, this is how much you're gonna get. And I would always make sure that that's what they got. Even if it meant that I had to walk away with less money, I always bit the bullet because I was pretty much handling the business for the group. Yeah. But um, it just didn't work out. And um, then me and Jeff just started going back out by ourselves. And um, I can honestly say at the beginning of doing that, the shows were horrible. They were horrible. I, just the two of you? I, yeah, I, I enjoyed going out and I enjoyed the fact that people was calling and trusting us to come out, like, you know, without Kenny. But um, yeah, the beginning shows were horrible. They were horrible because we weren't rehearsing and we was pretty much learning as, as we would go. But that kept going and kept going and people kept booking us and booking us and then we started doing rehearsals. And, you know, if you see our show now, of course we're gonna miss Kenny Green, but I always put it like this, like if you, if you, if you open a can of soda, right? Say it's an it's a, it's a orange soda and you pop it open and you taste Coca-Cola, then it's a problem, you know? Yeah. But I think like with the intro shows, if you look in there, here's something from intro, you're gonna, you're gonna get that experience now. And we still have Kenny on the back and tracks and stuff like that. So we try to still bring him, you know, into that element and stuff. But it's, it'll never be the same. It'll never yeah. be the same. Yeah. 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 No, especially with that, his, his yes, um, vocal talent. Yeah. 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 But, I saw uh, Queen last summer. Oh, you did? I saw Queen last summer in Central Park and they had this lead vocalist. I don't know. Maybe that's yeah. who you're talking about. Adam Lambert. He was on a, American. Yeah. He was on American Idol. Um, okay. Back in the day with Randy Jackson and, and Simon Cowell, um, he was one of the, you know, and he, I think he came second or so, but yeah, so he, yeah, he, he can, yeah, he was, he was amazing on the show, but he didn't win it, but 
that's how we, I know him from from American Idol. So they actually Queen did a, you know, back in the days when American Idol would have a Queen stuff, and they were really impressed, and they kept in touch, and that's how they signed him on. And so he vocally he can he can handle it. I was impressed. I was like, wow. Yeah. So they got him from American Idol. But so we've got a, a documentary to expect in June. You said. Oh, the documentary is coming in March. Oh, March. Okay. With the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then in June, which is Black Music Month here, they're going to release another intro album. And that's going to be of remixes and maybe a couple songs that's in the vault that were unreleased. And I may have to fly to Los Angeles or do a Zoom with the people in the studio and kind of pick the songs because at this point, I'm the A&R for the project because the, pro- the person who was the A&R was let go about a month and a half ago. So <laughs> okay. Your vice president was like, you're it. So, you know, I do Zoom calls with her. Have my next call with her is on Tuesday. Looking forward so, to that. would this be on Atlantic? Um, it's going to be on Rhino, Warner Music Group, but okay, Atlantic is the phone. Rhino, yeah. So that's more their their um, Aretha Franklin's. Yeah, and, they're old, uh, yeah. Okay, so they they they're definitely they they're definitely pushing. Okay, they're definitely pushing out. So where is the documentary going to be streamed or released? Um, that's up to the film com- company right now. I know it's probably going to be either Netflix, Amazon Prime, or something. It's uh, 72 minutes long. It's a full feature film. Like I got, I watched the second cut two nights ago. Okay. First time I watched it, I cried three times. Wow. As soon as it came on, like within the first minute, I was crying. Um, in the middle, towards the end, my daughter caught me crying. She's like, Dad, why are you crying? I was like, I'm not crying. She's like, no, you're crying. <laughs> and I was like, oh. I'm happy, and she didn't understand. She's five years old, <laughs> crying because you're happy. You know, I, I cry because I want stuff. You know, I want to. Yeah. <laughs> but it was it was it just the the thing. What, what what was it the the most emotional part for you? Um, like when it first came on, <laughs> like just seeing it come to life. You know, okay. after the. So we've been working on it for a year and a half. We started before the COVID thing. We got a lot of the interviews done. And um, so really got Donnell Jones in there, Big Daddy Kane, Coco from SWV, Mr. Cheeks, okay. um, Sadat X from Brand Nubian. They have all in there. So seeing them pop on, seeing the friends and my dad's in there. You know, wow. Okay. Kenny's mom is in there, his sister. Wow. It's, really, it's, it's, it's a tearjerker, but it's, it's good. It's a really good. It's really good. Yeah. The other question was, are you guys still cool with Eddie F? Oh yeah, yeah, I speak, I speak with Eddie quite often. He's trying to put me up on some of those investment things like the Bitcoin stuff and <laughs> Bitcoin, he's like yeah. the original Apple stock people and stuff like that. So he kind of like coached me into getting into the stock market and stuff like that. And um, yeah, see yeah. stock tip for today. My stock tip for today is, and yo, I, mean, I picked up, like my friends, right, it was this one stock, J-M-I-A, it's like, um, it's kind of like Amazon in Africa, right? And it was yeah. four, it was $14. And I told my friends, I said, man, y'all got to get on the stock, J, J, J-M-I-A. So I was telling them, and at that time, I still hadn't got on it. Right? So when it re- went to $17, I got on it. And I kept seeing it go up and go up and go up. And I was telling my friends, I was like, I told you, I told you, I told you. So I would take a screenshot, send it to them. And one of my friends got so mad at me. He said, <laughs> she said, I just read something about J J M I A. It's called um, Jamia Technologies. He said, I just read something about them. Man, you better get out of there. They're getting ready to get sued. You better, if I was you, I would jump ship. So I pulled all my stock out of it, right? And guess what? Now it's at $57 a share. Oh. <laughs> he didn't know what he was talking about. He just got tired of me sending him, oh, you know. Okay. Okay. So, but my, my sister got onto it, and a um, couple other family members they 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 grabbed it and they just stayed there. And I always yeah. try to have a stock tip of the day. So my, my two I'm gonna give two for today. One <laughs> is AI, AI, which is artificial intelligence. That's going up about seven dollars a day now. It's at wow. one forty nine this year. Artificial intelligence, and my second one is going to be desktop metal. It's down today. But desktop metal is for the 3D printing. They're going to start making car parts using a 3D print. And that's yeah. the material. It's like the new steel. So that, that stock code is um, DM. 
it's no inside trading, so it's all uh, no inside information, so everything's legal. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That, that's kind of what I got from Eddie too. Kind of like how to yeah. make money with money and not like I'm not flashy. Like I, I can st if I stand up, it's not, not gonna be no name brands. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, mean, uh, I can't. Well, yeah. no, that's that's the one thing that that I've seen from him. He, he talked about investing in Apple so back in the back in the day when no one else was doing it and, and bitcoins and. And I think I've spoken to Father MC and others who 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 talked about investments and and mm -hmm. how much if you know Charles Barkley always, always said that Michael used to tell him why are you getting this big advance from your from from the from the, from, the, from the NBA it get stock options because that's you know mm -hmm. that's where the, the people make the money and he learned how to make money by not taking cash and wasting it and stuff so I guess mm -hmm. many singers and stuff don't really didn't follow that suit they probably got the cash and was spending it and thinking that yeah we'll go on tour my sister right <clears throat> i see another i see another gym with you that um a lot of like a lot of people don't know even jeff didn't know like three three four years like i i have a job right i got a day job i'm a new york city police officer i work for nypd but I, i'm retiring in july what? so now i will yeah <laughs> so yeah i retired july 1st of this year and um, I did the whole, I did the whole 17 years. I didn't have to do 20 years because of the military. So I could retire at 17. So for the past 17 years, I actually been a New York City cop and pretty much nobody knew about it in the industry. I can say it now because I'm getting ready to retire and I'm not really out on the street like that anymore. But um, yeah, man. You gotta, well, was that was that because you had to or why did you do that? I, I, I had to, I had to. That was in 2004. That was three years after Kenny died. Yeah. And um, the emergence of hip hop, not one phone call to come out and do shows. Um, I wasn't hearing the songs on the radio anymore. I figured that was the end of um, professional music. I still had my home studio and, you know, like people would come in and I would um, do projects with them. But as far as having a real job and feeding my family, I, I had to get a job. Wow. Yeah. So. That's almost done. My sister talked me into that. She's a detective and she actually, her last day of work is February 28th. Yeah. So, okay. So she, okay. But then when you joined the police, did they know who you were? Did they know by intro? A couple people here and there would, would make it out. Like certain places I would work, somebody would come up to me and say something. Or sometimes people would say, you look like the guy from intro. <laughs> Then somebody asked me, like, do you dance for intro? I was like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> okay. like nah, somebody, somebody asked me that before. And then I, I just keep it moving. But um, but then how was, how was, how's the life change? Because you're going from, you know, video soul and, and all this stuff to. It was, it was, it was hard. It was, it was hard. It was, it was, hard. It was a little, some, some days I could say it was quite depressing, but you know, it, it paid the bills and um, the neighborhood that I worked in wasn't like a, uh, black neighborhoods so nobody would ever make me out like okay, you know, okay. handcuffs so i'm like yo your buddy from metro you know nobody yeah. knew me. nobody knew me in the area that i worked yeah wow but yeah. It was that more that seems like a more dangerous job than being in in in, in iraq um it actually is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is it is yeah it's, it's been it's been uh it's been pretty interesting yeah Wow, so it, it, I guess it's very fascinating that with all the talent and all the music and all the stuff that mm -hmm. and all the royalty checks and stuff, it just it it, it, it it publishing it doesn't you know it it there's a, there's a limit to how much what that yeah, can do. Yeah, a lot of people don't think that you know when people think like the recording artists, they think of like Rick Ross, Jay Z, Puff Daddy. You know that's the Drake, that's yeah. the exception. That's the exception. Like ninety five percent of us really need to have real jobs, or you know, they're pretty much dependent on other people, and or going out every week making money from shows. And unfortunately, right now there's no shows, so there's actually some artists that I actually have to help out. You know, I actually send money to artists, knowing that one day you know they're gonna be able to go back out and repay me. But you know, got to do it. Do, but when you do shows, could the shows cover the bills pre COVID? Um. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. They could. They could. But but you you just advised look medical they... benefits though. Yeah, I didn't I didn't have medical benefits. Like I I have four children. 
I have three boys and a girl, and they all need medical coverage. So without me having a, a real job, every time they go to the doctor, that's money out of my pocket. So I needed to do it for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's I not like was a senior in college right now, and uh, he goes to St. John's University, and that's that's a whole nother bag, <laughs> you know. So I got to yeah. work and pretty much, you know. Wow, <laughs> that's what. Oh, okay. I mean, that's that's really fascinating. It's, it's amazing. I would, I would love to be able just to stay down here and just don't, and that's it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's not that's not the real deal. <laughs> well, I guess finally, just as we wrap up, mm. after the, the the release of the of the album in June, documentary in March, and you mm. and you retire from the police force, are you going to try and then start releasing music that you could start? earning income from oh yeah it's gonna be on and popping after july 1st friday july 1st <laughs> yeah it's gonna be on it's gonna be on and popping yeah i already said i'm gonna have the tour bus parked outside i'm gonna oh, so you're gonna be on, on the road with new members new music everything by that time the documentary would have kicked in the new album would have been out for about a month and then it's gonna be time for me to get out and promote it and i'm ready i'm ready wow yeah. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, but most importantly, to press the notification bell so that you can be notified when we do have a new interview. Loads to come, but thanks a lot for watching.